Shalom and welcome to another edition of Parsha Talk. I'm Rabbi Elliot Malamet in Highland Park, New Jersey, at the Highland Park Conservative Temple Congregation on Shamet. Joining me, my good friends, Rabbi Barry Chesler, Solomon Shakhtar Day School of Long Island, and Rabbi Jeremy Kalmanovsky on Sheikh Chesed, New York City. I'm wearing the sticker here. Uh, I saw a, a video of Rachel Gober Prolin, uh, uh, and uh, she is imploring us to remember. And of course, we are we have always been remembering, but but the sticker is 95. Uh, we're recording this at the end of the 95th day, 95 days in captivity for um, all of these the hostages, 130 more hostages, alive, dead. We don't know. We are uh, thinking about them, praying for them, and imploring people to to be aware, to be conscious of them, to pray for them as well, and. What can we do? There are we are we able to do anything? This is, of course, the frustration. I know that there's a demonstration in New York City um, tomorrow uh, or Friday. Rabbi Kalmanovsky will be present at the, the the demonstration outside the United Nations on Friday, um, and representing our voices there. And we are studying Torah really to to um, honor them and to think about them and to comfort ourselves and the entire community of our um, learners with Torah together with this Parsha, Parsha Dva'era. Uh, hey, Elliot, I just want, I always want to uh, reinforce, you know, what you just said. I mean, th there's a way in which, just before we yeah. got on this call, I had a Bar Mitzvah family in, in here and, and they, you know, they're getting excited and, and the mom said, you know, it's just so much that gives you despair about the world it's wonderful to be able to have something that gives you joy in the world and i just felt what, what you just said is perfect we study torah you know like there's much of the world that makes you say oh this is chaos this is meaningless and torah is the opposite torah says is how, how you at least the experience for studying torah for us is that it makes life meaningful and it makes life worth living and so even though there's so much sadness, so much sorrow, so much despair, so much killing, so much death, there's also life. And that's why uh, we're here. We're here to to remind ourselves of that, remind the people that join us uh, from week to week to whom we are grateful. We thank you and uh, we honor you for doing that. And we are studying this week's Parsha, Va'era. Va'era would be remiss if I didn't say it's an amazing Parsha. It is an amazing Parsha. Picking up from from last week, we, we of course uh, were introduced to Moshe last week, and we were introduced to the beginning of the the mission, his the challenge that Moshe has, and it's going to be a theme that runs through this parsha. You know, if we if we just dial back for a second, Moshe uh, gets commissioned basically, and God says to him uh, that that uh, you know you're going to go speak to the uh, to the, the elders and tell them that uh we're going to go you know we're, we're going to we're going to make a delegation before uh pharaoh and uh we're going to ask him to send us out so that we can that we can be uh we can worship god in the in the uh desert um and that was back in chapter 3 verse 18 where it says as follows here uh God spoke to God of the Hebrews spoke to us. Now, we will travel three days in the desert. And we will offer sacrifices to God. And, and that becomes a kind of frame for the whole experience. Because once we get into this parsha, we're going to hear the refrain over and over again. Shalach. Et ami ve'avduni, or shalach ami ve'avduni, various configurations of it, but it always consists of shalach ami and avoda. Send my people out and worship me. It's not just send my people out, but it's they're joined together. And you know, the 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 phrase resonates for us certainly because you know here we are in this experience of the the hostages, and we're we're we're, we're shouting shalach. You know, send them out. You know, we're not the Moses, but we are, we're the people. We have this voice. But but if we just kind of go back in time to Moshe and what his what his approach is, it's he is saying to Pharaoh, 
send them out so that they will worship me in the desert. So my question is, you know, we say that all the time. W what does it mean? And and are we to take it literally or or help help let's try and help each other understand this because it's it's a refrain but it's i don't think it's accidental and i don't think it's a throwaway line and and i don't i don't know where you want to pick that up here but but i'm going to turn to one of you to interpret give me your best interpretation on shalach ami vevduni so i would go with the idea that it's locational or geographical that the point is that God cannot appear in Egypt to be worshipped. He will only appear as the agent of the plagues. In order to worship God, you have to go to the wilderness, and the wilderness reminds us of Moshe's first encounter with God at the burning bush, which was in the Midbar. And one thing... Let me stop you there for a second. This is... I'm trying to wrap my head around why, why can't we worship God or why can't the... Because I, I think one of the things that we sometimes overlook, especially us who are committed to a historical approach to the Tanakh, to the Bible, that God was not a universal God for all of the Bible. He was, in fact, geographically bound. There are intimations of this in the story of Jacob wrestling the angel and where God would be when Yaakov... The patriarch leaves the Eretz Kanaan, and when God will reattach himself to Jacob as he comes back as well. And therefore, God is not everywhere where he could be called upon, but he's in certain places. Right? It's not an accident that Revelation took place at Mount Sinai. It was a specific place. It didn't happen everywhere. The only idea that we have in the Torah that God might be everywhere is in the symbolism of the Mishkan, where God will be wherever the people are, which can be anywhere, but is always at one point in time, precisely at one place. I, I would give a more polemical interpretation of why he doesn't well, you're want You're a polemicist. To... I am. So, so there you go, which is, well, I, I, I'm not ashamed of that. I would say, you know, fully on Egypt. And, so, and, and, you know, in this, in this, in, in as eloquent as that is, which is, you know, I I'm I'm not going to set foot in Egypt. I'm not going to put my presence in Egypt. And notwithstanding the fact that that you know I I I want God. I want to understand the um, omnipresent God. That that the God of their ancestors is is with them because I mean I we do have texts that say God was with Joseph. God was with you know etc. And and so God is with them. Uh, but God can't be worshipped there because it's a defiling place. He can't be worshipped, and he's also distant. I mean, you know, no. one of the things that we overlook, I think, is that God only takes note of the slavery in Egypt at the end of chapter 1 or chapter 2 of, uh, of Shemot. For the entire period, however you want to configure it, 200 years, 400 years, six weeks in a day, that the Israelites are slaves in Egypt, God is not with them. There's no evidence of it. And, you know, it finally says at some point, God takes note of them because he is removed from them. And I think we have to, to reckon with that. By the way, later reckoned. on in the chapter, later on in the Parsha, you know, in, in support, I guess it, it, this is roughly in support of your, of your claim, but, at a, at a slightly orthogonal angle over here. Um, you know, you, you guys wanted to say, God won't show up in Egypt. God won't. Um, it's a defiled place. Moshe does make an argument at a certain point to Pharaoh during the plagues narrative. I think this is still in Vayar, Bay although maybe it's in Bo, that um, it, it, Pharaoh says, okay, so sacrifice to worship your God, but here in the land, Moses says, no, no, your people will kill us because we're going to kill your sacred animals. So he gives a very simple, um, gives a, gives a like a logical homespun, not grand theological, just human human scale answer that what we do will be offensive to you and it'll get worse. So again, here this may also just be a ruse, but uh, but it gives a, a human scale answer why the Egyptians don't want us worshiping here. So I want to say that that I think 
there's there are many layers to this. Um, and I think on the one hand, it is a ruse. That is to say that he's saying this to Pharaoh because it's a way of getting getting them out the door. Um, but there's got to be some reality to that. I mean, I, 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 I like the idea. I'm very, I find the idea compelling that that we can't worship in the land of Egypt because the land of Egypt is associated with our suffering, our, our servitude, our slavery, our humiliation, uh, and on and on and on. I like the idea, Barry, which you mentioned before, that, that you know, going to the wilderness, and of course, you know, the Torah is given in the wilderness, and, and to a certain extent, I, I think that this is what's being stated here, is that we're going to go out to have an experience. So, so leave, leave aside that the experience becomes Sinai, I want to say that that the anticipation to to gather the people and to to say to them or to say to Pharaoh, I want my people to come out so that we will worship God. My God says, send my people out so that they may worship me. So if you're Pharaoh and you hear that, what's your reaction going to be? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, at you're... a certain point, so again, in that passage that I was talking about, um, about the Egyptians will be mad. Pharaoh says, "Okay, you can go, but don't go too far." So Pharaoh's got this is one of those back and forth parts where Pharaoh's saying yes, saying no, saying yes, saying no, go, but don't go too far. So Pharaoh is is uh, um, you know he he knows he's losing. <laughs> he's trying. Well, to... but also we could understand that Pharaoh is playing a game too because he knows that's not what they really want. And he's going to be magnanimous in his way and say, look, I've come this far. You have to give in a little bit. So I, I want to just um, focus on a slightly different angle on this question. In addition to which, I this doesn't in any way vitiate uh, what, what we're saying about the nature of worship having to be in the desert, the nature of worship having to be outside of Mitzrayim. But the presence, and, and Elliot, you raised this by talking about the the recurrent use of the word avodah, 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 shlachdami Um, First of all, we we American Jews, maybe all maybe all people, but you know, 20, 20th and twenty first century American Jews, we remember the "let my people go" part. Of course, but not the "and though he served me" part. It's it's not the goal is is not freedom for humans to enjoy. The goal is for freedom for humans to then dedicate to higher purpose. Uh, the And so here I want to point out that the story, the the use of the Ayin Bet Dalet root, the Avodah word, the Avadim word, uh, is is constructed. Pharaoh has, ma'av, you know, Mitzrayim, Ma'avidim, they force them to labor. Vayavidu Bnei Israel, the Egyptians, Force them to labor. They are avadim lefaro. Well, the part of the story that I I would focus on the reason it's always shlachta miva yabduni. Let my people go that they may then worship me. Is the transition from being avadim to Pharaoh to being avadim to God. The you know we know this from the Haggadah. Is this actually a pasuk? Avadim hayinu lefaro b'mitzrayim v'kirvanu hamakom leavodato. God, we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and God took us out and brought us to God's avodah, to God's service. Uh, the semantic range of avodah or eved, eved is both slave, but it's also servant. It's it's both slavery, servitude, but it's also worship. And so I would say that the shlachtami uh, avduni, the repetition of let my people go that they may serve me, is to draw a very strong contrast between uh, slavery to Pharaoh and service or worship to God. In in the end of Leviticus, we get this great line that the, that the Talmud makes a great deal of, Ki libne Yisrael avadim avadaihem. The children of Israel are my servants, that they are my servants. Uh, meaning, and as the Talmud says, below avadim la avadim. And not, you, you are not slaves to other human serv- servants, you are not slaves to other human masters because you are servant to God, and that's the ultimate freedom. So I, I think this, that our chapter here in, in this parsha is hammer, hammer, hammer on the Abu Dawood 
to draw the contrast between human slavery and divine worship. So I, I want to. I just want to kind of go back and say, is it is it possible to take this a little more literally in that Moses is saying, I want to assemble this people outside of your boundaries and have a convocation, have a convocation experience where we where we do our own thing, where we worship our God, we and we whoop it up and we have our sacrifices and we have our um you know revival basically and um and what would be wrong with that we'll 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 get invigorated and we will it will just uplift us and send shlach et ami send my people out ve'avduni says god so that they may worship me because god god needs us god needs us to be worshiped and what what i want to say is that you know that there's something enticing about that. There would be something interesting, and and um, it would it would arouse curiosity on the on the part of Pharaoh. Certainly would arouse curiosity on the part of the Israelites because they've never had this experience. If they have this conversation about what what Moses is saying to them, and at, you know, in in the most narrow way of understanding it, this experience of Exodus is intended to get them started off on the worship of God, the service of God, and to really have a convocation. That convocation ends up at Mount Sinai, which in in our framing is the culmination of the Exodus, is it not? So what I would suggest is that the ceremony at Mount Sinai is not only a marriage ceremony, but it's also a kind of divorce ceremony as well. Because Pharaoh, I think, is no dummy. He knows if he lets the people go, he's losing them. Because the whole purpose of leaving is to worship God who cannot be worshipped in Egypt because Egypt belongs to Pharaoh. It doesn't belong to God in the human sense. You know, the whole earth is the Lord's, that's what the psalmist said, but Pharaoh certainly doesn't recognize that. And therefore, the quest to leave Egypt in order to worship God, is in effect saying to Pharaoh, we are not your people, we are God's people. We may physically serve you as slaves, but our freedom inheres in divine worship. I just wanted to add one other point that part of the significance of the Midbar, the wilderness, is that in a certain sense it's no place. Because part of the meaning of Sinai is that after that great event, we will no longer go back to Sinai. We will take Sinai with us. Yeah. The place is never going to be important again. And in fact, as far as I remember, only Eliyahu goes back. Right. So I, I like, I like the, uh, the line of thinking that says, um, for founding people, for founding a people, um, some massively binding ecstatic experience is really necessary that you can always go back. You, you may always be, you know, sort of a fated to try to recreate something futile and never, never get it. But I like the thought that in the in the creation of an Am Yisrael here, a shared worship experience, which, by the way, is is what we get. I mean, I would say we get it in the in the you know Pesach Mitzrayim element. Um, and I do think we get it at Sinai, and then at the, at the sort of capstone of the Sinai, Sinai's told, you know, a little bit out of order, maybe, because um, because Mishpat at the end of Mishpatim, as Barry was saying before we started recording, there is an ecstatic worship experience. Uh, yeah, I think that that that's pretty important that to for people to to have shared this joyful moment um, is always imprinted on their hearts. And just from from the perspective of the averages, like they have they have not had this kind of experience. At least at least we don't know. You know, it, it would be real speculation to wonder um, you know, what 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 constituted their mythology, what constituted their uh, imaginative experience, what constituted their knowledge of God, if they had that. You know, the midrashim, uh, you know, tell us that they. They didn't change their language. They didn't change their names. They, they, they must have had some kind of memory. Did they circumcise their 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 children, their sons? Um, and and 
to the extent that they were able to to keep their story uh and and now that moses is is saying to pharaoh god is saying you know they must be wondering well what does that entail and and perhaps they they do have uh you know oral memory or folklore of their their ancestors uh, who each had some kind of worshipful experience with god they all you know made sacrifices in in one place or another um or maybe not maybe maybe you know just just now they had to, they had to have because at the burning bush god says to moshe and then repeats it and the, you know tell them that the god who appeared to abraham isaac and jacob is is coming for them now it makes no sense unless we sort of assume that they that they had some connection to an ancestral story like you, remember we we talked about this a few weeks ago when Jacob goes down to to finally see Yosef, God says, "Don't worry, it's going to be okay. I'm going to take you down, but I'm going to bring you back up." Which I, I offered that I don't it I don't think it certainly doesn't refer to Jacob alive because he doesn't leave Egypt alive, and I would argue it doesn't refer to his burial, although that does happen, his burial in in, in Hebron. I would argue that that's a foreshadowing of you're going to go down to Egypt, you're going to be a slave for hundreds of years, but then you're coming back up and you're going to a promised land. So I, I think that the story only really makes sense if Moses is going to show up and say, okay, now's the time we've been waiting for. So as you're talking, I'm thinking, okay, so what is the extent of their of their memory, of living memory? And so, of course, I'm going to project here. You know, a human memory really spans about three, four generations. I mean, I, I have no recollection of anybody beyond uh, a great-grandparent uh, and and then of course no no living memory of only have f photographic images of great grandparents never met my great grandparents I've certainly you know I, I was lucky enough to to have grandparents um, but but beyond great grandparents I, I I have you know unless I do the real genealogical working you know, the, the mining you know and go on that show right <laughs> finding your roots <laughs> Henry you know. Gates yeah no but the the point is that that. The Israelites may know of their direct ancestors, um, but would they would they have known of their uh, mythic ancestors? You know, we know we certainly know of our mythic ancestors, but but if if someone were to take us into the studio and and do all of the research on our um, on our genealogy and discover that you know you are related to x you're related to the vilna gaon or you're related to rashi or you're related to david amelech or you're related to you know uh, uh, uh pick your illustrious character okay which i guess in a couple of generations or decades through artificial intelligence um we we might be able to link up a lot of the jewish people i mean god will so, it's interesting that you say that elliot because there's a curiosity that is echoed in the Parsha this week from last week's Parsha, because Amram is identified as marrying a bot Levi in the, the beginning of chapter two. And it seems pretty clear to the unvarnished ear that what that means is that Yocheva was a Levite, not that she was the daughter of the ancestor Levi. But in yeah. this week's Parsha, he marries his aunt, which means that she has to be a daughter of Levi because he's a grandson. And it seems that even in the Torah, they're kind of grappling with this difference between family because Levi is the fourth generation back. He's the great grandfather of Moses. And the mythic that um, he's also part of the, the ancestors, the Avot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I, I think that... Um... Uh -huh, right. Uh, obviously, that that is correct. What you what you said. Vayelech ish mi beit Levi, vayikachet bat Levi. Somebody from the Israelite clan married the daughter of the direct daughter of Levi. That's that's. You would have to understand, you know, Exodus six twenty in that way to 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 make sense of back in Exodus two, um, and and I think that. It's not really comparable to think about uh, 
what we know about ancestors. And, and by the way, let's just keep in mind that, goodness gracious, every single Jew, probably most human beings too, but I, I don't know about all the other peoples of the world, but virtually every single Jew in the world today does not live where their great-grandparents lived. You know, Eastern European Jewry is destroyed. Islamic world Jewry is destroyed. Lots of people move to Eretz Yisrael. Lots of people move to North America um, or, you know, or the other Anglo countries. Nobody, nobody lives in those places. So some of the, you know, our, our memories are destroyed. I think that the, the, our memories are not individually rich in that respect. I think that this story makes sense. And this is also in another topic that we've talked about in the last couple of weeks, exemplified by the motif of carrying Yosef's bones, that, that they have a strong, the story makes sense because they have a strong mythic saga-based, like you can imagine the people who tell these sagas, the Icelandic whatevers, um, that our people are something like that. That Because if Moses showed up to listen, God spoke to me and showed me the golden tablets and the angel Moroni, which is all these stuff that happened to the Joseph Smith and the Brigham Young and the Latter-day Saints. The Israelites would have said, this guy's crazy. No. But he told them something that they could assimilate to their to their prior knowledge. And so they story. said, yes. Told them yeah. their story. We live in stories. It's such a yeah. great idea. You know, and so, and so we're living in the story and we're trying to identify, you know, what what part of the story they know and so by 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 citing the the relic the, the you know that there there are bones they're literal the body of someone is going back and it's moses's obligation to take that back or moses will take that obligation on and we'll see that in a couple of parshas right means that there is a tangible link so so i mean we're you know we're going off of the off a of field here but the the you know the the people i mean to what extent do we have that tangible link, uh, you know, in 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 actual concrete objects? We certainly don't have bones around, but we don't. We have we have stories. We we do have words. We do have. Oh, well, we, we might have, have a kiddush photographs. Cup What's that? I'm sorry. We might have a kiddush cup or candlesticks, and we might have those kinds of objects. Or, or a to fill in. photo. We might have a, a you know a, a a passport photo or something. A private. You know, we all have our private little archival things of our ancestors maybe and a lot of that was destroyed you know we're, we're living without a lot of that okay um just you know we have a couple of minutes left i want i want to just take it take a a dip into this pasuk at the end of chapter six um god speaks to moses by the better than i am more and the other i i'm god the barrel part of melech mitzrayim uh, speak to the king of Egypt at all the things that I say him. Moses says, Hen ani I am uncircumcised the lips. And how will God how will Pharaoh listen to me? What what does that mean? And what do you think that how how, could, how should we interpret that? I'm gonna throw that to you, Barry. All right. So I, I think it's best understood that Pharaoh will not understand me because Moses has a speech defect. We have to remember that he's going to speak God's words. We have to assume that God's message, even spoken by a Naras of a time, should be clear unless Moses has a defect, which prevents him from being understood, and then that makes sense. And the solution that's going to be given is for Aaron to be the prophet and Moses to act like God and I raise the possibility that perhaps there's an element of impairment in God that when God speaks to human beings, we also don't get it. Yeah. So so I, I want to try and find the, the metaphorical piece of it. I mean, I'm, I am drawn to the, the very plain interpretation here, which is that there's an impediment. But but could could there be something more going on? Here? Well, I think I've mentioned this before. One of the stunning parts of the Torah is that there's not one line attributed to Moses that one would think comes from someone who is slow of speech. He speaks quite eloquently. 
Especially. Right, the only reason that we know he's in the Rasa for time is because he says so. <laughs> and, right, and, not because anyone said Moses. I don't get what you're saying. Can you write down something? <laughs> you know, he's, he's an a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a Right. Dvar, dvar, you know, I read Dvarim, actually. You are a lot of words there. Yeah. So so the way the way that this reconfigures then is that there's a partnership between Moshe, Moshe and Aharon. And and that that's a very effective uh leadership methodology, I guess, a leadership strategy. That that you have two people presenting. I mean, speak about you know what? What would it have meant to have his his brother, his partner, in front of Pharaoh, his brother in front of the people, and and um, you know, I don't know. I don't know where 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 to really go with it because here's we, where it goes: is yeah. that the story of Moses and Aaron is one of the redemptive brother stories in the Torah. Okay, perfect. That in the book of Joseph, beginning with the first set of uh, the book of Breshit, beginning with the first set of brothers, Cain and Abel. It's a problem throughout. Um, Menashe and Ephraim perhaps is the only case in Breshit where it seems to work. But as you said, Moses and Aaron is a partnership because brothers can shevarachim biyachad can dwell together, as the Sama says. Right, and so the, and and they both have um, parallel and com, uh, complementary agenda. Complementary, yes. Yes, and they have a program. Uh, and and of course, you know, we'll, we'll go to the end of the Torah where where they are re remembered differently, or the people relate to uh, both of them, each of them differently. Um, Moses is the guy that you really can't get near, and Aaron is the guy that you want to have a beer with, I guess. <laughs> but which means, you know, that which is what they did at the Golden Calf, as I recall. <laughs> well, you know. Um... The, uh, the the expression first of all you know Moses presumably I mean we, we have we have other examples of this the, the Talmud says that they had a different personality and different sense about about law and norms Moses says Yikov Hadin et Hahar let the law pierce the mountain we're going to do what's right doesn't matter let the chips fall where they may and Aaron is the who was Oheb Shalom the Rodeb Shalom and he gathered the people together and he made peace among warring people. So, and one guy's about worship and one guy's about teaching, but the, we, I didn't think in previous years, we've, we've observed this verse that at the golden, at the uh, burning bush, you know, God's trying to nudge Moses to agree. God says, uh, go back, Aaron will meet you. Yeah. He's going to, you're going to meet you and he's going to see you and he's going to be happy. And Rashi says this wonderful thing. He says, He's not jealous over the fact that you have a higher position than him. He's happy to work with you. And that's 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 so great. That's exactly what Barry said. And it's striking the number of times that Aaron is identified as Achicha, Moses' brother. I think that's critical importance. And of course, you know, as the Parsha plays itself out here, Aaron, Aaron does function in significant ways. I mean, there's a whole set of patterns in terms of you know who's doing what and and whatever, which we 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 we're not going to go into, obviously. Um, but there is a there is a partnership here. They're both working together. They both have different facets of of the people, and and it is a model of leadership that that works um, with the understanding that Moshe is you know the primary leader, but Aharon is is always going to be there for him and and manage the people with him. And uh, with that, we come to the conclusion of our. Our discussion this uh, this Shabbat. Um, we're looking forward to reading this again. We are thinking and praying for the rescue of the hostages and for the release of the hostages, praying for the safety of uh, the idea of soldiers and um, all of our thoughts and our concerns, our prayers for Am Yisrael, Klai Yisrael, Medinat Yisrael as we go through this challenging time together. We want to thank you for watching and listening. And we want to wish everybody a beautiful Shabbat. Shabbat Shalom. And we'll see you next week on the next edition Shabbat of Parsha Talk. Shabbat Shalom.